So recently I popped in to one of the most tremendous second-hand bookstores I have ever visited. This bookstore boasted a selection of some truly special, rare first editions that pose a dangerous temptation to any lover of literature. But there was one book in particular that caught my eye, a book that's very special to me. Yes, there were mint condition first editions of Ian Fleming's Bond novels. I have wanted to collect these for the longest time. The covers are absolutely gorgeous. Yes, there were rare first editions of works by Daphne du Maurier another author who is very personally dear to me. There was a rare edition of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas, very tempting. There was even what seemed to be Chairman Mao's little red book behind some protective glass. I found all of these volumes incredibly tempting, but there was one work in particular that rose above them and I didn't leave with it. I left the store, but this book didn't leave my mind or my heart, and I found that I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I went back to the store and I talked myself into picking this work up. And so I became the proud owner of the UK first edition from 1954 of Herman Hesse's Siddhartha. Now, this book is personally very special to me. It immediately throws me back to summer of last year when I was leading a lecture series on this book. This is the book that I would put into the hands of a reader who primarily reads non-fiction and wants to branch out. Perhaps they want to breach the modern classics, perhaps they're finding it difficult to wrangle with imaginative literature generally. I would put this book in their hands for a number of reasons. First and foremost, it's very, very slim, it's digestible, but also incredibly resonant. Ultimately, however, this is a mindset book. It's all about presence. It's all about finding stillness. It's about enlightenment, and there's a very good chance that if a reader picks up this book at the right time in their life, it could be life-changing. Now, today we're not talking primarily about Siddhartha, nor are we talking about that wonderful bookstore visit, but today I would love to talk to you about how to start book collecting as a hobby, where to begin, what you should collect. We're gonna throw some ideas out there, and you're probably thinking, hang on a minute, I'm already a book collector. You should see my hoard. You should see the books that I have amassed over the last few years alone. And I most certainly personally relate to that. One of the most pressing issues in any lover of literature's life is storage. But what we're talking about today isn't mere acquisition, but collecting and connoisseurship. And there are three prerequisites that any prospective collector of books needs to keep in mind. They're the three P's. Patience, passion, and planning. Now, many readers getting into book collecting as a hobby might think, what about money? Isn't money a prerequisite? And the thing is, yes, it could be, but not necessarily. Of course, we're dealing with antiquarian items. We're dealing with physical assets, and they are investments. And if you invest wisely, they won't depreciate in value in the way that other things do. So when we talk about investing, we often have the underlying assumption that we're going to need a lot of money, but that's simply not the case. What you need is time and a love for the specific area that you are collecting in, because that's a prerequisite too. You want a very specific plan of exactly what you're going to collect. Collecting anything and everything isn't a collection, and very valuable, historically important collections can most certainly be built across time with very little money involved. But first things first, you need to have a plan. The first thing you should do is take a look at your current bookshelves, because that will show you where your bias for collecting lies. You already have areas of interest, subjects that fascinate you uniquely. You already have your passions that go deeper than just books. Yes, we're passionate about books, but niche down. Try to go as specific as possible, and this is good advice in many domains across life. You don't want to go where the market is saturated unless you have a serious edge. It's all about niching down, it's all about specializing. It's about finding what is unique to you. But looking at our shelves could certainly trip us up because one only needs to take a brief glance at my shelves or watch a couple of my videos to see that I'm interested in Shakespeare. Does that mean I should collect Shakespeare? 
The answer, funnily enough, is absolutely not. Don't collect Shakespeare. That should be rule number one for book collectors, getting into book collecting as a hobby for the first time. You almost certainly shouldn't collect Shakespeare. Why shouldn't you collect Shakespeare? Well, for the very good reason that you're probably not going to get very far. If you're looking at book collecting, you're probably going to want to toy with the idea of collecting first editions. Now, there's many different areas you can go in when it comes to your collection, so we'll talk about those in a minute, but you'll probably want to get some first editions. Can you get first or early editions of Shakespeare's works? If you want a folio, can you get your hands on it realistically? Realistically, no. There aren't that many first folios, for example, knocking about, and the ones that are, are worth millions, and they belong to the museums. Book collecting as a hobby should be a lifelong adventure, and it should be fun. It's all about the thrill of the chase and the pursuit. It's all about stumbling across gems that you've been looking out for for years, and when it comes to Shakespeare, you can't really do that, unless you really niche down and you find a sub-sub-topic in Shakespeare studies. So the likes of Shakespeare, probably not our first go-to, probably not what we want to collect. And another thing to keep in mind is ultimately you want to collect that which you love, as opposed to that which is fashionable, because in the book collecting world there most certainly are trends, there are fads, there are fashions, and things come in and out of fashion. Another thing you probably don't want to do is collect only for posterity. Yes, you want to think about the worth, the value of a certain piece, particularly considering a certain piece as part of a wider collection. But if the only reason you are collecting something is because you think it will appreciate in value and be worth something someday, then you might need to think again. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could do both? If you found a subject area that you are absolutely besotted with, and it's also worth a fair bit of money. That would be great. But the reason we don't go after money first and foremost, is because it is a lose-lose if you are wrong, because if it doesn't appreciate in value, you have also not enjoyed the thrill of the hunt. You've also not been collecting things that are personally meaningful to you. If you go after that which is in your heart, you can't lose. It may not make any money someday, but at least you've had a fun ride and at least the collection is meaningful to you. Another question tied into the what to collect debate, you may wish to ask yourself if you're interested in collecting things of literary significance or if you're more interested in, for example, going down the popular fiction avenue. I absolutely adore high literature, as you know, but you can't get away from the issue that if you want to collect Jane Austen, if you want to collect George Eliot, if you want to collect Charles Dickens. That's when money, in addition to perseverance and maybe a little bit of heartbreak, is going to be a prerequisite. What you want is to go after books that are fun, they're interesting, they're inexpensive, and perhaps they're a little bit tricky to find. Not necessarily expensive, but a little bit tricky to find. That's the sport of book collecting as a hobby, going after things that are difficult to find. So as opposed to high literature, which might break the bank, perhaps going after the dime novels of one's childhood or the childhood of one's parents or grandfathers, that could be a really interesting route to go down. Because the thing with dime novels, for example, is that you will stumble across rare gems that are inexpensive and interesting and fit into a wider collection that is more valuable than the sum of its parts. Essentially, what I'm imploring prospective book collectors to do is do not choose the well-beaten path. Stray away from the well-beaten path and forge your own way. And once you settle on what you want to collect, the next thing you need to do is learn everything you can about that subject. Now you're collecting information about that subject. For example, let's say you want to collect detective fiction. You absolutely adore the genre, you want to learn everything you can about that genre, and you want to collect the important pieces, the lesser known pieces. Well, what you're going to do now is start learning everything about detective fiction as a genre. Where did it begin? Who are the key writers, the key players? You want to get yourself some reference books, some manuals that are going to tell you as much as possible about detective fiction, because that is how you're going to develop your personal plan, your blueprint to making that collection 
a reality, taking it from fantasy into the realm of reality. That's how you can start going after your book collection. In addition to learning everything about the kind of books you want to collect, make the decision early on to go for first editions, if possible, and to go slow. Remember, this is a lifelong journey, and the reason why money isn't a prerequisite is because it wouldn't be fun if you could just buy the collection like that. If you could decide upon a collection and immediately have it in your hands, there would be no fun, there would be no sense of accomplishment, there would be no journey. And the journey begins shortly after you have settled upon your area of interest, because you're going to make a list of all the important volumes. You're going to learn what volumes would make a terrific collection, and you're going to start working from that list. And something that I hit upon very briefly, but I would like to emphasize, is think of your collection as being more valuable in its entirety than in the sum of its parts. You could end up buying one particular volume in your collection that isn't worth what you paid for it. You could end up buying a volume for pennies that isn't even worth pennies, but as a part of a grander collection, could end up being the piece de resistance, could end up being what you need to take that collection as an entirety to the next level. Now let's talk about what books you should collect, and we're going to throw some ideas out there, many of which are inspired by a terrific book on this very subject. It's out of print, but it is available in secondhand edition, and it's quite marvellous, and it's called Book Collecting as a Hobby, and it's a series of letters from a fellow by the name of Moore to the Everyman's Library Publishing House, and it's all about how to start collecting books as a hobby. And speaking of Everyman's Library, we have hit upon one of my own personal, slowly growing collections. I have adored this publishing house for the longest time. There are many different generations of Everyman books, and I personally keep an eye out whenever I go to a secondhand bookstore for editions that look rather like this. I love the history of the company, I love the printing, I love their story, I love the works that they have chosen to publish, and ultimately, I like the works as physical items. So that's one example of a book collection where the entire collection is going to be more valuable than the individual parts. For example, you could pick up this Everyman's edition of Moby Dick by Herman Melville for a couple of bucks, but if this edition was just one, in a wider collection, it would be much more valuable. As you can see, it's numbered 179. If you had all of this generation of Everyman's Library, then the entire collection would most likely be more valuable than the sum of its parts. Book collector Moore, in his series of letters to Everyman, uses the examples of a Keats collection, the poet John Keats. If you wanted to build an incredibly authoritative collection of John Keats, you wanted all his different letters, you wanted all of the different editions, well, eventually you're going to come across some editions that aren't worth too much on their own, maybe a couple of pennies, but you get them anyway, because if that was with perhaps 100, 200, 300 volumes, then you're talking about something that is incredibly valuable. Moore also throws out the marvelous idea of collecting one book every single year from 1640 onwards to the present day. So 1641, 1642, 1643, and march your way through, and you'll find that some books are necessary to help your collection along. So you need a book from 1789, for example. Maybe you're not too thrilled about the specific book. Maybe you have to overpay for it to get your hands on it. Maybe it's not worth what they're asking, but you're going to get it anyway, because it's part of your collection. It fits into the theme, it fits into the plan you have established. Indeed, you might come across a couple of volumes that aren't worth anything at all, but they are if you have formulated a compelling collection. Now, the start date of 1640 is therefore a real reason to do with the pamphlet revolution. If you go back before 1640, well, then you're going to need uh, a lot more than just patience and perseverance. You're going to need a little bit of money too. Let's throw some more ideas out for cool collections. If you find yourself fascinated like I am with original serialized publication reading schedules, for example, if you're fascinated by how the first readers of George Eliot's Middlemarch would have consumed that novel over the course of a year in real time, if you're fascinated by how the first readers of 
Charles Dickens, how their relationship with, say, Pip in Great Expectations would have taken much longer than our modern reading habits would lead us to develop, then you might find yourself on the hunt for periodicals. Charles Dickens has many periodicals. I came across a collection of his in a pub recently, a collection of his all the year round, which had Great Expectations published in it. It had works by Wilkie Collins. There was different collections, different editions from different years. I absolutely wanted that edition. I couldn't believe it was just sitting in a corner in a pub. I was a little bit cheeky. I did ask if I could purchase it, but they said it wasn't for purchase. It was decorative. And uh, of course, that's rather absurd to think that a first edition of Charles Dickens's All the Year Round is being used for decoration, when a quick search will reveal that it's worth thousands of pounds. But that would be a really cool idea, collect the original periodicals. Actually, some of the best collections involve popular literature or popular fiction at different periods of time. We've spoken about the dime novels. Some readers want to collect comics and graphic novels. Some readers will collect the yellow backs from the Victorian era. These are really strikingly beautiful items and they have a really curious history too. We're talking about a really interesting time in the history of literature. We're talking about the explosive growth of the railway system and how commuters would pick up volumes to read on lengthy commutes. There's a law surrounding all of that which is fascinating. If periodicals aren't your thing, you might contemplate getting into collecting chapbooks. Many of our favourite poets were posthumous and their poems were circulated in a very limited degree in intimate personal circles during their lifetime. One could build a very impressive collection, curating the most important chapbooks in the history of poetry. But definitely there's a good hunt to be had there and there's a good story that comes with the collection. Good collections need a story running through them. Another cool collection idea is to focus on works that hold dedications to patrons. There is an incredibly interesting history when it comes to patronage in literature. If it were not for patrons with exquisite taste when it comes to the arts, a lot of our favourite works of literature simply wouldn't exist. We know that Shakespeare most certainly relied on patronage. The history of great literature generally is the history of patronage, patrons of arts. So you could make a really exciting list of those works that have the most historically intriguing dedications to patrons in the front of the volume. That's another great idea from Moore's series of letters on book collecting. Another one is you could form your collection around the theme of literary imposture. That's actually a really interesting area to go down. Look into Ossian's cycle of epic poems. Look into William Ireland and the Shakespeare forgeries. The resurfaced Shakespeare plays that nobody had ever seen before. Oh, it's the latest Shakespeare play. It's taking the literary world by storm. No, it's a fake. It's a forgery. That would be a really cool collection. Just collect those works which are literary forgeries. There's a great story to be had there and a really fun hunt. If you have a hobby outside of reading and literary appreciation, you could form your book collection off the back of your hobby golf, photography, chess, for example. Can you imagine acquiring some Soviet-era chess manuals, for example? You could also form your collection off the back of translations. There is a YouTuber that collects Harry Potter books, published in every edition, in every language, from all over the world, and the collection is truly impressive. Indeed, I keep my eye out for works of literature that have appeared on the Hardcore Literature Book Club syllabus or will appear, and I try to collect as many different translations of the different works as possible. That's a fun little game to play too. Of course, your collection could be about foreign books, and your collection could tell the story of the history of translation into English. I've got the first English translation of Hermann Hesse's Siddhartha here, but can you imagine getting a first edition of a Constance Garnet translation? of Dostoevsky or Tolstoy, for example. Constance Garnett, who is unfairly denigrated today, she did a terrific thing. She formed the first significant bridge from Russia to the West. 
and gifted us with some of the most resonant stories of the human spirit at its breaking point, the human condition under extreme and sustained duress. That was her gift to the world, that was her gift to us. So there's a cool story to be had there. If you're interested in biographies, you could make a list of the most significant biographies in literary history and begin collecting. There are historically significant biographies of Boswell, Scott, Blake, and many more. You could have an author-specific collection. I have a couple. I have one that was overtly planned, and I have one that was a happy accident. This here is a first edition of Stephen King's Misery. It's my personal favourite Stephen King, up there with the Dead Zone, but I do have a few favourites. I really love this one, and I'm slowly building my way through King's canon and trying to get my hands on first editions, early impressions, but I've also recently decided to settle for book club editions, which have the exact same cover, but typically they will leave out the price or an ISBN. It gets a little bit, you can get into the weeds with book collecting and it differs depending on what you're collecting and who you're collecting. But this one's a genuine first edition and I'd say it's in terrific condition. You can see Mr. King here on the back looking at his constant reader, wondering if the reader is able to discern what he's really saying in this book. I've been loving this book and even though it's a first edition, I'm not putting it on display or just leaving it in a collection. I read it and I've been reading this one um, every night for the last few nights it's been keeping me up it's a great story I've read it a few times the movie's great of course one cannot read Annie Wilkes without picturing Kathy Bates one cannot read Paul Sheldon without picturing uh, James Kahn my other kings I'm fairly sure are either book club editions or if they are first editions their second or third impressions so there's a little bit of a difference so they're not technically first impressions but I've got The Shining I've got Carrie I've got Salem's Lot and The Stand so far this probably makes me a philistine when it comes to book collecting but personally I just like to have the original cover and I like to have the story as it was closest to the author when they first put it out. So with The Stand for example we don't have the massively expanded edition which is the most current popular edition on the market and the story is a little bit different. It's nice to see what the story was very very early on, it's, like, it's nice to see what the original story was. That's a collection that's quite fun, I love the lore around King but indeed you may have your own specific author that you would like to collect too. The author who I have been inadvertently collecting I realized this relatively recently I was going through his books and I realized that I had first editions for maybe a quarter of them I had a lot of first editions and that is one of my favorite critics of literature Harold Bloom this is a recent book this was published posthumously this came out during lockdown and this book means a lot to me I was very happy to realize that this is a first edition yep it will be worth a little bit of money someday uh, not that I have any intention of selling it it has a personal uh, sentimental meaning to me this Shakespeare series by Bloom that he published towards the end of his life this is also very meaningful to me I managed to get these editions uh, very soon after they came out. I unfortunately misplaced my first edition of the King Lear volume so I had to reorder and I found that that one is actually quite difficult to get hold of but I managed to get hold of it and the bookseller obviously thought it was special because they wrapped it in a nice uh, protective cover. If we're talking about first editions and you haven't quite settled on what the theme of your collection will be, maybe you don't want just one theme, maybe you want several, then a little tip is to keep an eye out for books that are in the contemporary conversation. For example, there is a Booker Prize long list and short list that comes out every year. A good thing to do, a good practice, is to get hold of those works the day they come out because you are going to get yourself a first edition. This is a practice I indulge in regularly, I absolutely adore it. I did that for Neil Gaiman's Norse Gods, unfortunately I didn't get a signed copy. I picked up this beautiful first edition of Lincoln in the Bardo by George Saunders, the year it won the Booker Prize. I have a really nice memory of going into a bookstore in Toronto and picking up the only copy. I don't know why there was only one copy, it was in the window, and I went home and I listened to the multi-cast production whilst reading along, and I think this is a tremendous book, but ultimately it's beautiful, and importantly, it's a first edition, so it'll probably be worth a little bit of money someday. Again, that's not why we buy them, we buy them because we love the books. More recently, I picked up this 
beautiful Faber and Faber hardback first edition of Kazuo Ishiguro's Clara and the Sun. And it really wasn't too long after I picked up this book that I went into a secondhand bookstore, a vintage bookstore, and I saw that they were selling the exact same one for a hugely marked up, hugely inflated price. But luckily I got this the day it came out, I had it sent to me, and I've tried to keep it in relatively pristine condition. So if I had first editions of Kazuo Ishiguro's other works, then that would be quite a valuable collection. Now, why do we want first editions? What's the big deal about them? Well, the philosophy behind collecting first editions is that the first edition is the closest work to the author. It's the closest work to how the author originally wanted it to come out into the world. It's the work's first birth. It is that author's first say on the topic, or the first say when it comes to that particular story, and subsequent editions are revisions. They're a little bit different. So you want to get as close to the author as possible, and a first edition is a good way to do that. Now, when it comes to trying to discern whether you have a first edition on your hands, that's going to differ depending on what we're talking about. Very often you can go to the front of the book and you can actually see it printed there. Very often not having it printed there is a tip off, but sometimes there are unique things that you need to look for. So a good thing to do is to develop a relationship with your bookseller and to learn as much about your subject as possible and there are some wonderful YouTube channels that go into first editions and rare books. One of my personal favourites is called Peter Harrington Books and they show off a beautiful uh, selection of first editions and they talk you through why different works are historically significant. Another reason why you want a first edition is because it requires you to go out of your way to pay homage to your favourite writer. It is a way of showing respect. Anything that is difficult, that takes time and a little bit of effort is ultimately a way of paying some respect. And of course, I think that's ultimately what we're doing. We are celebrating our love for a specific writer or a topic, and to celebrate love, one needs to go out of their way. Perhaps the only way you can get closer to the author in question than obtaining a first edition is to get a signed edition, to get an early proof copy. It's fairly obvious why people might want a signed edition, but they usually come with a bit of a hefty price tag. But that's because the author themselves, they've actually put pen to the paper that you now have. I've got a few signed editions that are very special to me, maybe we'll show them off someday. I have a signed Hemingway, I have signed Terry Pratchett novels, I actually met the man. I also met a contemporary writer called Joe Dunthorne and he signed some of his novels to me, so I treasure those too. And again, this might sound like heresy to veteran book collectors, but when it comes to first editions, when it comes to signed editions, again, I don't keep them in a display case. There is an argument to be had that one potentially should. There is an argument to be had that one should be using gloves to turn the pages. I get that, I'm personally very careful, but ultimately, I want to read these books. And whilst these books are an investment and that's a nice way of justifying maybe splashing out here and there, maybe treating yourself here and there, whilst they most certainly are a little bit of an investment and there's definitely money to be had when it comes to amassing a significant collection and then selling it, ultimately book collecting is a hobby that is all about love. These collections are physicalizations of our love. They are expressions of the ideas and the writers that we hold most dear. It's an expression of love and it's also a journey over the long term. And it's a tip off to where we personally designate our own meaning. Ultimately, however, for any lover of literature, seeking after special volumes that will fit in their collection is a nice way to build in some surprises, some excitement, some indulgences. It's a nice way to celebrate that which nourishes you and that which gives you joy on a regular basis over the course of your life. So I just wanted to put a couple of ideas out there and I would really love to hear from you. If you are already collecting, what are you collecting? What items are you most proud of? How long have you been collecting? Indeed, if you have been acquiring up to this point and now you're thinking about collecting something specific, let us know what do you want to collect and why? Who do you want to collect? What theme do you want to collect? I would really love to know. I think it would be really cool to see what different book lovers hold most dear. So let us know. And for now, I'm off to go enjoy my Siddhartha. Have a lovely day, everybody, and happy reading.
Bye-bye for now.